In this video, I am going to demonstrate a method for converting 8mm and Super 8 movie film to computer media using a Canon flatbed scanner with a film adapter, which will allow you to edit the film frames in a photo or video editor. There are really five different ways you can convert movie film to video. The first is to take the films to a professional transfer service. And that's fine, but it's the most expensive solution, and it lacks the satisfaction of a DIY project where you can control all of the process. The second method is to buy a dedicated movie film scanner. But there are also very few professional scanners built for such small amateur film sizes. And so they are also expensive. Cheaper consumer ones are available, but the reviews indicate that you get what you pay for in terms of image quality. The three DIY solutions are photographing the movie film frames with a digital camera, making a digital video of the projected film, and using a home scanner. I'm going to give some background and then demonstrate how I made the last choice work. But be warned, converting film yourself is not easy, and it's a huge time sink. It has to be fun or else DIY film transfer is insanity. Introduced in 1932, 8mm movie film was actually 16mm film, which has run through the movie camera twice. Super 8 was introduced in 1965, and it was simpler to use because it came boxed in a cartridge. It also gives a larger film frame as the sprockets are narrower. It doesn't look like much of a difference in the picture, but the first problem to be overcome in converting such small gauge film is the tiny size. It's really small. As film is analog, it's not possible to relate it in pixel sizes, but I'd say 8mm is usefully about a thousand pixels wide. I'd say it can beat the resolution of any amateur grade video camera up until about the mid-late 1990s although now even an iPhone can capture much better and clearer images. Some websites discuss photographing the frames on a stand with a digital camera, but I just couldn't get this to work because no digital camera I can afford can focus on the film close enough to create a usable image. What would really be required is a true DSLR with a macro bellows. My Nikon one can't focus that small. A macro attachment rendered images clear in the middle but fuzzy on the edges. My Canon PowerShot G10 did not a bad job at 14.7 megapixels, but the big problem is registration. I have about 10 200 feet reels of film which calculates to about 160,000 frames. In order to usefully photograph all of these frames, the film frame must be in the same place every time exactly, otherwise the image will jiggle and wobble and be useless. Thus I'd need not only professional cameras, but also film holders and other high precision instruments to secure the film at close tolerance. Not happening. It sounds obvious. Just point the digital camera at the projector and run the film, and shoot high resolution video. In practice it works, but not very well. You need to place the camera in a position to film the film without blocking the light. You could try buying some reflecting gizmo to bounce the light, or you could shoot onto some ground glass from behind. I just shot at a slight angle and used Photoshop to straighten the image. But that's not the biggest hitch. 8mm runs at 16 frames a second and Super 8 runs at 18. NTSC television works by scanning the picture at 29.97 frames per second. More precisely, every other line of resolution is scanned every 1 60th of a second, and a complete picture is assembled 30 times a second. Thus, if you just aim a camera at the screen while you project the film, the image will be crooked, the lighting will be uneven, and there will be a nasty flicker. The 8mm segment here of my dog and my father from 1981 is from a VHS videotape I made of my films in 1985. But standard VHS outputs 250 lines of resolution, which makes for poor quality video. By 2003 I had webcams and decided to try again. Webcams typically max out at about 640 by 480 and by using software filters in Virtual Dub to straighten the image, to adjust colors and lighting, to sharpen the focus, and most importantly to process out the flicker with D-Flicker, the results were not great, but getting better. What I needed to do is to slow down the projection speed so that I could advance the film one frame at a time and capture frames as individual photographs. I had tried reducing power to the motor in the projector years before with a light dimmer, but that didn't work and it scorched a patch of carpet when the dimmer burned out. Stronger medicine was required which was to tear out the motor and replace it with a small metal crank that my father welded for me. This also required that I move the original tungsten lamp from the projector. 
Home projector bulbs from the 70s are so hot that they would fry the film in seconds if it were motionless. The film is safe because it passes by too quickly. I found an Energizer bicycle lamp with a 300 lumen LED illumination, and that was bright enough to illuminate a small sheet of paper nicely. I also bought a wooden plank to strap everything in place, and I raised it off the floor with some floor stops. The problem was the crank, which not only made a horrible squeaking noise, but it also jiggled everything around, and turning the crank to advance one frame at a time was a terribly slow way to go. I decided to motorize the film advance. As English professors don't generally get much training on motor wiring and classification, this took a while. I wanted something which would run slowly, yet be strong enough to turn the projector flywheel. I finally bought a geared 12 volt motor that ran at about 200 RPM. It spun nicely excepting the rubber belt on the flywheel, which being about 50 years old didn't like the stress and kept breaking. Now the projector was running at 4 frames per second, and while I can't capture individual frames that fast, I could film video and then perhaps work out some method for eliminating the dud video frames and speed the video back up. But this is a 40, 50 some year old projector and it's tired. The sprocket was not pulling the film to the exact same place each time. Plus the image looks grainy and seems to accentuate scratches. And no matter what you do, there's always dirt in the gate. I tried different virtual dub and premiere filters to deshake and stabilize. I tested some of Fred's scripts with AV synth. None of this worked well because the projector's film gate hides the edge of the film frame and so you have no reference points to align the image against. What I needed was to be able to see the sprocket. The last route was to use a flatbed scanner to capture the film. In 2004 I purchased a Canon LIDE model with a transparency adapter. This worked well enough for 35mm film, but for movie film it was slow and scanned at 2400 dpi, giving me about 500 by 400 pixels, which didn't justify the potential labor involved. There are dedicated film scanners, but they're usually also for 35mm negatives, and they can't handle a continuous strip. But in 2018, flatbed scanners are a lot better. I needed one anyway for work, and so I bought a Canoscan 9000F Mark II with a built-in transparency unit. I've always liked Canon, and this project hasn't changed my mind. This is a boat anchor of a scanner that has a strong, bassy growl to it. It certainly sounds better than the old crank. One of the first issues is that even if the transparency unit will allow you to lay anything you want along the vertical middle of the scanner, you can't use the entire 11 inch vertical space at one time. The scanner reserves a small horizontal strip at the top and bottom to align and check itself every time it scans, and this area needs to be kept empty. Thus a vertical line of film going upwards across the scanner won't work unless the film is cut into sections. Not happening. I thought I would get cute and advance the film diagonally so as to dodge the registration area. This did work, but it meant an enormous area needed to be saved and scanned, and it was taking minutes to scan and chug through saving a 3.1 gigabyte image for each section. Unfortunately, the only time efficient method was to go horizontally, left to right across the flatbed. As the transparency handles 8.2 centimeters, that allows 16 frames of Super 8 or 17 frames of 8mm at a time, roughly one second of film per scan. The Canon scanner does have some nice dust detection algorithms, but I unfortunately have needed to turn them off and just do straight scans. A single reel of 200 feet movie film gives you about 900 scan files. That's already about 12 hours of scanning for each reel, and using the FAIR software might double or triple that. You can see that I made a mask out of cardboard and taped it to the underside of the large format tray. This also provides a visual guide to aligning the film and marking sprocket holes. I found some transparent 35mm negative sleeves and cut them shorter to secure the film, so that the film enters and exits a narrow sleeve and is held straight. At first I had the sleeve cover the film over top to place some weight onto it, so that it would be held flat against the scanner plate. But this just filled up with dust and dirt, and so I went commando after a while. Usually movie film that is in reasonably good condition will lie flat if it's straight. Occasionally, where the film is damaged or has a nasty splice in it, I weighed it down with coins on the edge. The Cano scan's focus can't be adjusted, so having a film close to the glass is important. But you don't want it pressing too hard or you'll get a halo effect. 
advancing the movie film in counts of 16, 17 frames each time gets boring fast. I reason that this can be measured out, so I just need to slide the film between visual markers. I don't want to scrape the flatbed scanner, so I built a small stand next to the scanner. That way you don't need to open the scanner lid either. I took two old CD jewel cases and cut them so that their edges face each other and glued them so that they form a tight path for the film to move along. After marking out 16 Super 8 and 17 8mm frames, I just use a tiny screwdriver to slide the film sprocket along from the left marker to the right marker. Then I tore off the support arms from the old projector to make a stand to hold the supply reel, and I took apart another smartphone tripod from a dollar store to make a take-up reel stand. I have to turn the reel manually, but such is life. This is what ScanGear, the, the Canon scanner software, shows. I have a selection of 2.77 by 0.39 inches, and this gives a TIFF scan of about 13,000 by 1,900 pixels at 142 megs each, which I save to a solid state drive. I'm scanning at 48-bit color at 4,800 DPI with unsharp mask on. I could go up to 9,600 DPA, but it gets really slow, and apparently the scanner's true resolution can't go that high anyway. This is the whole system, which probably ran me about $10 for mini tripods, glue, tape, paper, and ties, not counting old CD jewel cases or chunks from plexiglass. Half a frame per second isn't a great rate, but it's a nice mindless activity after a while. As I keep stressing, you have to find this fun or it will drive you crazy with how much time you will consume. And the hardest part isn't done yet. That will need some computing wizardry. Each reel results in about 900 scan files of 16 or 17 frames each for about 13,000 individual frame images per reel. Using a photo editor to straighten and cut out each one of these frames and with consistent registration would be insane. This requires software help. The scans are emulsions side down and sideways. The first task was to use a batch file in Photoshop to flip the images 90 degrees and reverse them, and that is easily done. The more difficult problem is that every image scan is slightly crooked. Perhaps if I had precision metal film guides to hold the film, this wouldn't be an issue but it's not going to happen with cardboard and plastic from dollar stores. So first, the frame strip needs to be vertically straight before we can clip out the individual frames. This could be done with Photoshop's ruler tool, but that's some 10,000 files. After digging around and looking at Fred's and other sites, it seemed to make sense to use a Photoshop batch script to automate this drudgery. Photoshop also allows a more direct level of action scripting, which is basically easy JavaScript suitable for my soft liberal arts brain. What I needed to do was to automate a process to select the top and bottom sprockets and use the X and Y bounds of each sprocket to calculate how much rotation Photoshop should apply to the image. How do we do that? Photoshop's magic wand tool is what saved this project. Magic wand's strength is that you don't have to be exact. Like horseshoes and hand grenades, close enough is good enough. So long as you select inside the sprocket hole white areas, it will fill out the sprocket selection area nicely once you've set the tolerances. My first action script attempt analyzed the top left position of the sprocket hole selected and then compared it to the bottom right position. By measuring the difference between the two, the script can tell Photoshop how much angle correction is needed and do a rotate. But my script was a poor one because it could only understand the numerical X difference. It didn't know how far apart the two sprockets are vertically for true calculation, and it didn't know whether the strip leans to the left or right. I needed help, and the nice people at the Adobe forums helped me with the math, in particular John Mack. John helpfully advised that I use the color sampler tool instead. What his script does is that the user selects a white point within the sprockets of the topmost and bottommost sprockets, and then a line of code searches to find the left and right limits of that color in each sprocket. The code then looks for the vertical difference between the two sprockets and does a calculation to render the rotation percentage required. This all sounds difficult, but it can be automated with a Photoshop script. Like Magic Wand, the color sampler just needs to be anywhere inside the sprocket hole, and it can do its work and the computer can chug it through while you're out having a smoke. Every once in a while, especially with leader film, the color sampler will get confused and you'll need to manually straighten strips. 
For good measure, I also added some lines in the script which use the first color sampler coordinates to shave off some pixels off the top of the image so that the first sprocket hole will be in about the same Y area in each file. This will be important in the next step. We now need to clip out each frame into its own image file so that we can string them together in Virtual Dub or Adobe Premiere for editing. Compared to John's, it's a simpler script. It takes the coordinates of the magic wand selection and then expands them outward in each direction so that the entire frame is selected. This way, each frame will have the sprocket hole in the same position and will be registered correctly. I can crop and make things pretty later. The point is that each frame image is exactly the same size, with the sprocket in exactly the same place. This would still require that I use the magic wand on each of my 160,000 frames to make that initial selection. But remember that with the magic wand, close enough is good enough. Like my straightening action, you just need to be somewhere inside the sprocket hole to select it, and the wand will fill out the rest of the sprocket. If so, this can also be recorded as a batch action. So I recorded an action where I did this. 1. Select frame 1 sprocket hole with magic wand. 2. Execute script to extend selection size to entire frame area. Next, crop and save. Next, undo. And then select frame 2 sprocket hole and do the same thing on and on for all 16 or 17 frames. You need Photoshop to save each one of these frames with a sequential number based on the strip file's name. Otherwise, the script will keep rewriting the same film frame over and over. But that is solved with another hack. Have Photoshop add a serial letter to the end of each file so that it doesn't overwrite the prior one. The resulting folder is a sea of duplicate letters. But so long as the files are in the right order, they can be renamed by Windows Rename function. Select all the files, right-click the first file, name it, and then all files will be incremented. For some reason, my Photoshop crashes every few thousand frames of rendering and I need to restart. I also get a bad image when the script runs across a broken sprocket hole or a bad splice. But out of roughly 13,000 frames of reel, I average a few dozen bad frames which need to be manually recut. That's not a bad failure rate. This is all a hack solution, but it works surprisingly well and gives a final frame image of about 1130 by 780 pixels for Super 8. Another nice feature of Photoshop is the ability to fix badly over or underexposed film. I shot some film in Hawaii in 1992 on an ancient brownie camera, and I chose too low an f-stop. In Photoshop, choose the yin-yang looking moon icon under layers, choose levels as the option, and then change from normal to multiply in the settings next to the layer image. At this point, I will probably do some light cleanup of dirt on the frames, and then let Virtual Dub's Dirt and Scratch plugins filter out some of the minor deratrus. After then, it's off to Premiere to speed up and slow down the shots where necessary and add music and sound effects. As I've repeatedly stressed, this entire process needs to be time efficient as there are so many frames. And often, good enough has to be good enough. As well, at Super 8, it will never look as clean and pure as digital video will. But in a way, that's a feature. Part of the attraction of Super 8 is its gritty, earthy look. And that's how I've done this, and you're welcome to message me with questions if you're working on a similar DIY like this.